on? How's everyone doing? Good. Oh, come on. Woo! Yeah. Awesome. All right, so today I'm going to talk to you guys about something I've been working on, and it's about web components. So component is a word that is very ambiguous these days. If you start talking to a random person who's a software engineer and you say component, if you, you, a lot of times you have to clarify, what, what is a component? What are you talking about? Are you talking about a W3C web component, a React web component, Ember, Angular? We've all got components. The, 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 the simple idea of a component is just you want to encapsulate some sort of view logic together. How you do that is, is you know, varies amongst the frameworks. Obviously, Ember has its own way. There's the Ember 1.0 way, and there's, there's the new Ember 2.0 way, um, which we'll probably see some sneak peeks later um, uh, this afternoon about. But if we don't, I do highly encourage you to take a look at because it's a complete new way of, uh, not complete new way, let me, let me rephrase that. It's a much better way of writing components uh, in Ember and much more performant. So, but I'm not, I'm not focusing on that here. My talk is about universal components. That means not components written for Ember. So universal, used and understood by everyone. And that means that your, their, your buddy who you know, swears by React, swears by Angular, swears by whatever crazy you know, framework of the month is, he'll be able to use your component. How many times have you been like, oh, I need a, a multi-select combo box, or I need a table that uh, does sorting, or I need X, or an, uh, I need Y, whatever it is, and you go out and you, and you can see all these results. They're written, but they're written in Angular, they're written in React, they're written in the jQuery plugin, you know, so it won't, you, you'll have to wire up all the bindings yourself. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy we've got ourselves, in my opinion, it's kind of crazy we've got ourselves in this situation where our view layer is so tightly coupled to the rest of our application framework. We're not able to share um, code like we really want to. Like in the jQuery days, before we got spoiled and, and had all these bindings and stuff like that, in the jQuery days, jQuery plugins was how you shared code. And it was super popular. In hindsight, we're all idiots, but it was super popular, it's super awesome. It still is today in a lot of circles. But um, I, I, I want something like that, you know? And, and so basically, I, I am declaring war on all frameworks uh, view layers. And obviously, that's a, it's a lofty statement. It's you know shock value. But uh, I, I am, indefinitely. Like, like the goal of what I'm trying to do is so that all these frameworks no longer need to have a, a view layer. So like basically, Ember would not ship with a view layer, would be my best goal in the world. Now that's you know long ways out, and uh, you know they you know the Ember has their own opinions. The core core team. I'm not a core team member, so, but uh, so who who am I? Why am I talking about this? Uh, I'm Jay Phelps. I uh, I'm a senior uh, front end engineer at Netflix. Um, uh, you can find me at underscore Jay Phelps. Uh, the regular Jay Phelps on Twitter is taken by like a 16 year old who retweets football stuff. So that's not me. Um, I've asked him, hey, you know, you never use Twitter. Can, can I have your handle? And he just never replies, but then continues to retweet football stuff. So I'm underscore Jay Phelps on Twitter. But um, so yeah, please follow me, uh, tweet me, get in hot debated discussions, call me a jerk, whatever. Sure. So uh, <laughs> thank you. So uh, it, as many of you are probably aware, I'm not the only one who's been trying to solve this problem. The browsers as well, and, every, and you know, there's a lot of really smart people out there. The W3C, the organization that makes the standards for the web browser, most, mainly the HTML and CSS, um, they're coming up, and have been for numerous years, a specification to make a standard web component format. Basically, the TLDR, because I'm not going to teach you all about what a normal W3C web component is, is that the browser wants to, you know, how, you know how there's a select box and it has options inside of it, and it has all this special functionality, and all you have to do is include it on the page? They want you to be able to build that, those type of things. So that it, you know, it's just it just HTML and it just works. You don't know, you don't need to know how it works. It just works. That's the point of uh, of a component encapsulation. So there's a specification and it's a working draft. Some parts of it are, are very very well defined, very well um, understood and, and agreed upon on the browser vendors. Other parts not so much. If you've been following lately, 
Um, uh, the Shadow DOM portion of it is the most controversial of, of all of them. It, and it, uh, the initial specification was actually shipped by Chrome several years ago um, and then shipped behind a feature flag uh, behind Firefox. But the browser vendors basically just were in deadlock for several years on the specification. So thankfully, oh thankfully, they finally got back together recently and they are rediscussing Shadow DOM. Um, for those of you who, who had followed it prior, the, the implementation that will probably end up actually being finalized is uh, somewhat different, uh, especially how you do uh, node distribution. But uh, that's you know, very technical stuff. But, um, but they, some of the stuff is implemented today. And the stuff that is not implemented today, you, a lot of it you can polyfill. So with what's implemented today and what, what's polyfilled, what is actually possible? Can you build these awesome components that, that, that just like you can in Ember with all the awesome uh, features that we're used to? You know, what is it in the real world? Right now, it's, you know, it's not always rainbows and butterflies. So uh, in the real world, there's a lot of things missing from the spec because there's a lot of things that they're like, well, that would mean we'd have to be really, really opinionated, and we can't get a room of full of people who are from different backgrounds to, to agree on that. So let's look at what's missing first. And I'll give you a little hint. Can anyone guess what would be, based just off this, what's missing in the W3C web component specification? Anyone just, can anyone guess, just yell it out? Yeah, there are two. Someone said data binding. The other person said interpolation. Um, so, yeah, there's no interpolation uh, of, of any kind built into it. Now you can you can roll your own implementation, but there's no there's nothing built in. So in, in, initially, you know, you might might feel a little bit like this, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> If you have no, if you have no data, if you have no interpolation, that means you can't have bindings, right? Because you can't put a placeholder, have it interpolated, and then update later. So, we're, we're now we're going back to Spock again. <laughs> and of course, here we go. No helpers, no directives, none of the cool stuff that we're used to in our view layers. So yuck. I mean, it, it's it gets us it gets us part of the way there, but. We created these, you know, we've got computed properties, observers, bindings, all this stuff that makes us super productive today, and they don't have a story for it. Not even a little bit of a recommendation. There's a template tag, and inside of it is just inert HTML. The rest is up to you. So this is how I feel. <laughs> what do we do? What do we do? <laughs> all right, let's, let's start filling in these gaps. So many years back, when, when the web component specifications came out, um, Mozilla started working on something called X tags. And the point of X tags is to basically uh, create these polyfills for the, for the custom elements and HTML imports, um, and then also add this, this very thin layer on top um, that adds some basic sugar, some very, very basic sugar. Now, you're not going to be able to read this, but it's very jQuery-esque how you, you define the components and it's got you know callbacks and it actually reminds me of like jQuery slash backbone. Um, but it really doesn't give you a whole lot. It doesn't give you doesn't give you the bindings, doesn't give you uh, interpolation, none of the really fast re-renders and stuff like that. It's 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 we need more. So who's the other kid on the block? Right away out of the gun, Google came out with Polymer. And I must say it is awesome. Um, it's got declarative data bindings, so that uh, that means that elements on your on uh, your your uh, view can be bound inside your template and uh, then update automatically when they're changed. Here's an example um, uh, using uh, Polymer 0.5, which, uh, as many of you know, Polymer just recently hit 1.0. Uh, I'll talk about that here in a second, but. Um, here you can see this is actually this code is actually not too dissimilar from an Ember template. From a you know you've got your your curly braces that are very similar and on tap. Um, you know there's uh, actually an R I think there's an RFC or it's just been talked in the in the uh, IRC uh, group about the on tap on click type of uh, similar syntax. But in general, just this is this is not too much too dissimilar from Ember. Um, so let's check that off. Seems cool. 
Computed properties, um, not the same as how we do it in Ember, but uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's good, it's good. You, can, you have a, a number property and computed squared is number, you know, times number and it will compute it and save the result and recompute it when it changes. So it's not the prettiest syntax uh, coming from Ember, but it works, so it, we'll check it off. It's got observers right out of the bat, um, uh, very much Sprout Core 2.0 uh, style, you know, the, the uh, observers are automatically uh, registered uh, just by the suffix of having changed at the end of it. You don't have to do anything else, it just gets automatically called if you just pre uh, suffix it with changed. So, cool. Uh, and by the way, observers are an anti-pattern. Uh, I think Steph will be talking about that later. Um, Here's what it looks like when you want to define an entire, poly an entire polymer component. Um, it's maybe difficult to read, I apologize. Um, but the TLDR is that you define the, the, the tag name you want, your, t your template and style, and then basically the class or the component that's, that's the JavaScript that's going to wrap that and basically be your view controller. Um, so it's, it's pretty good. And uh, you know, this was out for, for several years. And there's an entire ecosystem of Polymer components out there. Um, there's like webcomponents.org or customelements.org or something like that. There's an entire ecosystem of components. Um, a good, it, when you first start searching, you're like, wow, this is great. If you actually try and use some of them, a lot of them are incomplete. A lot of them don't work at all. Um, a majority of them are not maintained. And um, the biggest issue um, is that it was an alpha, right? So it's a 0.5 alpha. It was more of an initial proof of concept. And uh, bindings and re-renders and, and initial renders are, uh, can be slow. When I say can be slow, it's always a relative term, right? If you're building a very simple, very simple app, like an arguably barely even an app, it's more of a website that just happens to have some dynamic functionality, Polymer would, would be just fine. It's, you know, it's not slow like for very basic things. But if any of you guys have seen like the DB Monster example for Glimmer and those type of things where, um, where you really need to be able to push the boundaries of it because you, you need a giant table um, or you need a lot of things updating in real time. Uh, for example, at Netflix, um, we, we uh, create real-time dashboards that have you know, tons of graphs on them. And they're all being you know, fed data from a web socket. And there is so much DOM manipulation, so much stuff going on. Polymer literally just chokes. It just locks the browser up. And uh, that's the 0.5 version. So now Polymer 1.0 came out about uh, two and a half, uh, 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 two and a half uh, three weeks ago. And they, they had the, they basically the big thing on their really, really crappy performance was that they were polyfilling the entire Shadow DOM specification. And, and uh, basically it was fast in Chrome. Every other browser, it sucked. And, um, so now they came up with a concept called Shady DOM, um, which is basically like, well, what do you really, what do people really want out of Shadow DOM? They want style encapsulation, and they want um, the ability for your uh, when you when you query your element, basically you want you don't want your your elements inside your component to be uh, mixed and matched with the elements that that the uh, consumer of your component provides. You basically want that separation. Um, and that's kind of outside the scope of this talk, but uh, if you're familiar with Shadow DOM, you know, that's the general gist of things. And that, that made it so much faster. Not, they actually quite literally rewrote the entire Polymer framework from the ground up. I'm, I'm sure there was some, maybe some copy and pasting here and there, but I followed it very closely from the 0.8 to the 0.9 to the 1.0, and it's a, it was a ground up rewrite. The, their, uh, implementing their own virtual DOM, they're they're doing a lot of better things as far as actual uh, as far as paying attention to rendering. Because the the initial version of Polymer, it was like rendering fast was like an aftersight, right? It's focusing on everything else, and then rendering it's just like well, well, whatever, you know. So it works great for buttons, works great for forms, falls over when you try to do a giant table of data, falls over when you try to do a chart that's updating all the time. Um, and there are exceptions to this, you know, um, but uh, in our cases, it did. So it is fast, and, I, and this just landed. So I've, I've been, what I've been working on, I've been working on for quite some time. So I am evaluating uh, 1.0 more. I still need to do some more tests, so the verdict is still out on me. Um, but in my initial test, it still is not fast enough for me. And looking at the implementation that they're using for, and uh, following the discussions, 
Um, they're kind of very, they're not secretive, but they kind of aren't as open as a, as a community as like Ember, and, and uh, they're, not a very, they're not very accessible. I ask them a lot of questions, and they're kind of just like, kind of brush me off, like, a, like, ah, that's implementation details, why do you care? It's like, well, I just care because, you know, I want to know the future of this framework and make sure that, it's, that uh, they're not reinventing the wheel. And uh, that, that's, uh, what, that's one of my biggest uh, qualms with this is I, I, there's so many virtual DOM implementations now that React uh, came out and, was, and really showed that the virtual DOM um, is one way to go that's really fast and performant. And, and uh, Glimmer takes a hybrid approach, letting you use virtual DOM, but also letting you selectively re-render re certain parts. Um, you can opt into that as a, as a, as a tool with, with HTML bars. So I'm still not convinced. And so I am still going ahead with Graffiti. And uh, my, other bigger, my other big gripe is, wh where is ES6 and ES7 in this? You know, Polymer, the goal of, of, of Polymer is to be like, this is what the future is. But ES6 and ES7 is not a first class citizen. And for me personally, I'm addicted to it. I'm, I'm, stage, I'm, I'm stage zero on Babel. And that means that I get the latest and greatest, whatever the features are, I'm using it. And uh, I am that type of person. You know, I, love, I like to trailblaze. I love, I love to get the new features. Um, and mainly because I love to get feedback on them, right? What worked, what didn't work, um, things like that. So there, there's, a, there's a couple projects out there you can find of third parties trying to basically shoehorn the uh, ES7 stuff into, into Polymer. You can make it work, but there's no built-in stuff for decorators and stuff that I, that I want. So <laughs> what now? So several months ago, I, uh, I'm, I uh, actually do know React. And I, know, uh, and I would say Angular is the one I know least out of the three major. But uh, I know React fairly well. And uh, uh, some of you may know uh, Netflix uses a lot of React. We use a lot of Ember, too. But we also use Backbone, Polymer. We've got the whole gamut of stuff. Um, but on the client side UI, like the public facing stuff, um, most of it's React. And so um, when I was basically tasked with, uh, my manager came to me basically and said, hey, you know, we're, we're duplicating a lot of effort. People are coming to our team and saying, hey, you've got really great visualizations. You've got really great com like components. We want that. Like, wow, I, we want that. How can we do that? And we're like, well, it was written in Ember. And they're like, well, we're using Angular, or we're using React, and so you, you boot a separate, you know, boot an actual Ember app, or just, you know, like pull in all of Ember just for one little thing. Yeah, you could do it, or you could put it in an iframe. But it's just really not what we wanted to do. Um, so we started looking. That's that's when I started looking at Polymer more seriously for some of these really hardcore situations. So I, I started with the knowledge that uh, React and Ember were super fast. I knew that. Um, they were both really fast, especially with Ember with 2.0 with their Glimmer engine, which has proved itself and will continue to prove itself in performance. Actually, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot to go. Basically, it set the, the foundation uh, to create even better optimizations. Why is Ember fast? HTML bars slash Glimmer. And uh, Glimmer is a buzzword. Yeah, they came up with it, whatever. But Glimmer is not an Ember-specific thing. It's actually it's a mesh of, of, change, of, of huge fundamental changes to how HTML bars works with uh, changes to how the view layer works in Ember. So that means that it's not necessarily coupled. The, the whole Glimmer uh, approach is not necessarily an Ember thing. So I went out and I said, can I use this super awesome fast thing that I know that they're going to support? and, and, uh, and and thankfully, you know, the, the core team members are really good about separating things into separate modules that, that make sense. You know, there's a clear distinction between HTML bars. There's actual tests just for the HTML bars library. Um, it's not perfect, but uh, it, it is very, very robust. And the answer is clearly, yep, I can. So uh, today I'm going to introduce to you um, Graffiti. And uh, for those of you, I, I actually. Uh, in my conversations with people, I've noticed that people actually haven't gotten why I called it graffiti. Tagging, custom tag, tag. Uh, yeah. Okay. Tell all your friends. Yep. So, so what, what is what is the basic graffiti component look like? What's a simple thing? Here's a basic one right here. So we got 
ES7 syntax, some of you may not actually be familiar with that. And if you're not, uh, I really strongly recommend you, you go to babel.io, uh, I think it's babel.io, or just Google search babel and you'll find it. Um, and, and learn more about e the ES7 syntax and start using transpilers today. You know, start, um, uh, most of you are probably generically familiar with some of it. You may just not be familiar with the class and the decorators. The decorators are the things with the at symbol that are in front of it, like reflect to attribute. But uh, I'll really, really, really quickly run you down through this. Uh, I'm creating a class called my uh, counter component, and I'm extending HTML element. Now, if you know anything about the W3C web component specification, you actually aren't you're not supposed to be able to do this right now. You're not supposed to be able to do this. And the reason why is because of your, you can't actually call the constructor of a built-in HTML element class. It calls, it uh, does illegal invocation. Thankfully, I'm a smart guy, and I figured workarounds around that, and the library shifts with those workarounds to let you basically experience the future when, when they do allow you to do that um, without having to do object create and set it to the prototype without having, you know, basically you had to disconnect the, con the constructor because you, did, you didn't want the constructor to come along with it. But in this case, the constructor does get, com comes along, it just becomes a no-op. The, uh, the, excuse me, the HTML elements constructor becomes a no-op. Your constructor, however, you can provide a constructor into here and it'll actually be called, uh, which is unlike any of the other web component frameworks out there today. Your constructor will be called when you have a custom registered element. I know that sounds weird, but if you've been using W3C components, that's, you know, there's the created callback is the only way to, uh, is the equivalent of a constructor in this case, but I'm trying to mock the future. So um, in this case, uh, I've got a property called counter, and I've got a property called background color is equal to blue, and then I've got, a couple, I've got an event here. I've got uh, a hash. So I'm saying events equals, and then I have a function called increment, and then when this gets called, it's going to increment counter. Seems fairly straightforward. So what's the, what's the decorator thing? What's that reflect to attribute? Well, decorators uh, is something coming in ES7 or, or ES2016, whatever they want to call it, um, that basically allow you to decorate a given property or function on a class or even the class itself. And what does decorate mean? It's basically just a function that gets called on the, the property descriptor so that you can change things to it. Uh, if you have no idea what that means, that's perfectly fine. People, library authors, are going to use the crap out of this because it makes things really, really awesome. Because you can just say reflect attribute, and you have you don't have to know how that works or what that you know reflect. But what that means, by the way, reflect attribute, it means that when the property on your on your component counter, when the counter property changes, the attribute on the HTML element will also change. So it'll also have a counter attribute and it will also change, which is not the default. And why is that not the default? Because sometimes you might have a property that's storing an array or storing some huge JSON blob or storing some huge string. And you obviously don't want that inside an attribute inside the DOM. It makes it very, very unperformant and also just ugly. So um, you can opt into that behavior. So boom, we've got our ES6, ES7 syntax. <coughs> Very sexy. Now, some of you guys, maybe not, but some of you may notice this does look a little bit like Angular 2.0. Um, it looks a little bit of a feedback here. Thanks. I'll speak, I'll speak a little louder, I think. Um, it, it does look a little bit like Angular 2.0, but that's actually really just because we're using decorators, and so are they. We're, bo we're both looking to the future, um, not looking to the past. Um, other than that, uh, Ember, Ember uh, 2.0, once we get rid of some of the cruft, Ember is going to start to look like this as well. You're going to be able to start extending uh, and using actual ES7, e excuse me, ES6 classes and stuff like that. Um, but here's the full code snippet, which, uh, which before I, I excluded the uh, ex export defaults and the imports as well. So you get your register element call, you get your reflect to attribute from the graffiti library, and uh, yeah, and that's it. And now n notice the register element, I don't actually have to define the tag name. The tag name is inferred based off the class name. Now you can, like if you want to call your class something else, but then call the tag name something else, you could totally do that. Pass, pass a first parameter to, uh, to the register element, as your, and that, that'll be the tag name. But I, I really do like the Ember's convention of like 
dry, don't repeat yourself. Like if you're doing something all, if I can infer something, I'm going to. So basically, I use the uh, the framework uses the convention. Uh, it's going to take the, the the first part of your name minus the word component or element. So if you suffix it with component or element, it's going to take the first part and then dasherize it. So. Cool. We've got a, we've got the, the the class. What about bindings? I mean, I was stressing bindings. That's the big big thing that's missing. J bindings. Boom. Here's your template for creating your component. Now, something you'll notice right away is uh, this is slightly different than the way Ember Ember uh, does their templates, but it's actually very similar to the way Ember is going to probably do their templates. There's a lot of talk. There's an RFC out there for Ember, um, and the main difference is the root element. Notice that inside your template, you actually put your root element itself. You say, my counter. And why is that cool? Because then you don't have to deal with like an attribute bindings uh, hash where you map one thing to another in your JavaScript and all that stuff. If you want to, you don't even have to define properties. You can just go straight here and say, you know, like background color class or background color to any of these things. You, you can pass and bind all those things directly right in here, all in your markup. Um, and not have to deal with any of the property crap. Um, uh, the other thing about this is we've got uh, a, a, uh, you know, curly braces. This is based on HTML bars, so the syntax is going to be super, super familiar to you Ember, Ember folks. Um, there's a slight difference because, because I am uh, uh, going toward, trying to go towards more native approaches. Um, there's an on handler, which is very similar to like an action. Uh, except it actually invokes a native event uh, custom element. So it does, so, so it'll follow the normal DOM rules of bubbling, and you can disable bubbling just like you can in action and stuff like that. Um, but it, it is actually, it's actually a real DOM element, uh, excuse me, custom, ele custom event. So if someone is using your component um, in whatever framework, that's how they get it. You know, uh, you know, uh, bindings down, actions up. That's what they keep saying in Ember and in this component. It, excuse me, in this in this framework, it follows that same conventions, except if, except for bindings down, events up. That way, that it's framework agnostic. Any framework can listen to your event because duh, you can just add event. You can add event listener. So uh, in this case, I'm doing on click. I'm firing the custom uh, increment event. And it's that straightforward. Now, uh, going back to our, to our previous example, notice I had put a handler on here. So I will capture that event. Um, and, incre and the increment function would be called in this case. And it would, it would increment uh, counter. And, and the template would update. So that means that uh, counter value right there would, would automatically just, just keep incrementing as you, hit, as you click the button. Very straightforward. CSS, um, it follows the same, and this is uh, definitely evolving, especially recently with the, with the new uh, Shadow DOM uh, discussions. There's a lot of things evolving. I'm following it very, very closely, and even in some of the, I'm not directly in the discussions, but I'm basically lobbying, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better words. But for now, you're going to be able to, to use the sa uh, sim same syntax as before. So you can use the host pseudo selector. Um, to, to basically refer to the element and the component itself. And then all the styles that you put in here are actually scoped to the component itself. So that means that if you have IDs, if you have uh, class names, those type of things, they're actually scoped and will not bleed out um, of your component. And also, Unlike Polymer, Polymer does not currently do this. There's talks about how to do it, and they'll probably just notice my talk and steal how I'm doing it. But um, actually, I actually prevent styles from bleeding in as well. So it's, it was non-trivial to do so, but I figured out a really great way of doing it. So if you want to take a look at the code, you can. But basically, what does that mean? It means if someone says body color red, uh, all the stuff inside your component is not going to have a color of red. Uh, so woohoo, uh, your component can control its color without having to deal with that. Now, there's uh, sometimes you want that, that behavior, right? Sometimes you want to opt into inheriting styles. Sometimes you want themeability. Usually it's themeability. Um, and the, the direction that themeability, both Polymer and this framework, is going to go is by uh, using native uh, uh, CSS properties. 
uh, which is outside of the scope of this talk, but uh, mainly because A, I haven't implemented yet, implemented it yet, but, um, but uh, also because the, it's very, very in flux. But basically, you'll be able to, to say, like, oh, I want the, the, the kind of similar how you'd, how you'd style a bootstrap theme. You provide variables up front, and then all the components basically use that, that property um, inside their CSS. So how I, I just created this component. How do I use it? What does it look like? Well, it looks like how you'd use any other HTML element. You, my counter, I, could, I, can, I can, if I want to, pass in a background color attribute. And I notice that this is dasherized, so it's a normal, like how an attribute would normally look. But the, the framework, Graffiti, is going, the, it, the runtime is going to basically uh, camel case it so that it's going to assign it to, to both the, the uh, attribute and to the property itself. It's going to basically, once it sets the attribute, the attribute change callback gets fired, and then it sets the property. So um, the difference between a property and an attribute is a really long story, but the TLDR on that is that attributes have to be strings. Properties can be whatever they want. Now, sometimes they're named the same, but there's examples of like class name versus class. You know, there's the class name property, but there's the class attribute. Those are not the same. So there's a lot of confusion around about like not knowing the difference. Totally OK. The framework tries to basically uh, get rid of you needing to know the difference. Um, and if you guys have feedback, I'm all ears. Please definitely give me feedback. So what, once I put this on the page, page renders, what actually gets output in, like in Chrome, for example? Well, here's an here's example uh, what gets output. So uh, the class blue is there because I, in my previous template, I had bound the background color to, to be that class. And then we've got counter zero because I had said reflect to attribute. So it did. It reflected to the attribute. And then there's the background color uh, attribute that we passed in. And then there, there's our template. Now, uh, notice that the, the uh, hello world that I put in here get, got redistributed into the label. And why did it? Why did it do that? Well, going, I'm going to sweep back here real quick. It did that because of uh, it, it follows very similar rules to the Shadow DOM specification. You use this component uh, element, and basically you're saying, or excuse me, content element. Right in between label, there's a content element, and that, and basically that's just a placeholder. The the equivalent in Ember would be yield or outlet, depending on whether you're using a, lay, a layout or a template. Um, but uh, yield would be the, the, the most uh, uh, effective. But um, the, the syntax on this is slightly changing if you've been following. The, the, before, you used to be able to say select and then provide a selector. Now there's a new syntax for, um, uh, for something called slots. So I am following that, and we'll be following that along and updating graffiti as things go. Um, so all this work. How, what did it give me? Well, first off, it's fast. And I'm actually just scratching the surface on understanding the, the, the power of the Glimmer uh, way of rendering things. Not all of my, uh, not all of the way I'm rendering things is the most efficient it can be, because uh, HTML bars has two different ways of rendering. And uh, a lot of the ways I fall back on re-rendering all the things instead of, which is still fast, instead of just diffing just, uh, just small parts. So it's going to get better at that. It's going to follow along with Ember and uh, get that. But there's one thing I wanted to really quickly note before the, my, the end is that um, I'm actually using something from Angular 2. It's called zone.js. Has anyone here actually heard of this? Two people, good. So this actually is a really cool, really overlooked technology that I had never heard about. I'm not going to super explain it, but I'm just going to say that it, it's basically allowing me to do data binding in Graffiti without needing to use object.observes, which is not supported in any browser but Chrome. And the polyfills all suck, which is one of the main reasons the performance is so poor in Polymer. Um, but this lets me lazily know when, uh, indirectly lazily, dirty check. Um, whether whether properties change and it's really and it's it's kind of a combination of Ember's run loop with basically hooking into any possible asynchronous action that could possibly happen, right? So anytime data changes on your page, it's in response to something that was async, whether it be a mouse click, AJAX event, what ha a timer, 
when those things happen, that's when you want to actually check, hey, did something change? Because checking just with a, like a set interval every 10 seconds or something, or 10 milliseconds or whatever, like nothing's, nothing's changing during that time, right? Because nothing can change. The user is not interacting with the page. There's nothing happening. So check it out. Um, if you're a library author or if you're not, uh, there's a really cool um, uh, from ng-conf video about it, but I wanted to note that, that, that they're sharing, you know, that look, I'm using basically portions from Ember, uh, from Ember's core HTML bars and using parts of a Angular, using philosophies from React. All these frameworks are coming together and I see a future where, where they are going to blend. It's going to be a while, but I do see the future. So yes, it is open source. As of this morning, I pushed it, so push it real good. Uh, uh, so, so get up jphelps and then slash graffiti. Um, I'm going to be, now that it's out, I'm going to be continuing to update it. Please, please don't feel shy about saying you're an idiot, this doesn't work, or this is bad, why are you doing this? It is super alpha, so I'm warning you, don't use it in production. If you use it in production, it's not my fault if it breaks. Um, that being said, um, Netflix is going to possibly invest heavily in this technology in the coming future. Basically, it's in the R&D phase, and we're trying to basically decide, is this really, we're kind of getting our feet wet in it, and if we can figure, if we can really figure out this story, uh, we're gonna invest heavily in it. Um, so your input is definitely desirable, so please uh, let me know. So contributions are very much welcome. And I do wanted to give a really quick shout out to the Ember Core team, um, particularly those um, that let me bug them about HTML bars and Glimmer. Um, well, is, where is Matthew Beal, Nick Sonic? Can you stand up real quick? Can you guys give him a round of applause? <laughs> so, and then, and then, you know, like Yehuda's not here, but uh, Yehuda is a very hard man to get a hold of. But thankfully, he's very kind, and, and if you're persistent um, and explain why you're trying to get a hold of him, he will talk to you. And uh, he, helped, he helped me a lot, and uh, mainly because the changes that Glimmer made completely like flipped HTML bars on its head. So I got lost, because I initially implemented this months ago using old HTML bars. And then when Glimmer came, it's just like, I was just like, I don't even, what, what is this? What the heck? Um, thankfully, you guys don't have to deal with that. <laughs> but, and that, that's all for my talk. So um, I don't know if I have time for a Q&A. Yeah, yeah. yeah? We're on island time, so we're kind of <laughs> following in schedule. Uh, and I, please use the mic just so we can hear your questions. Completely. Hello? OK. Any questions? Uh, i got to run all the way to the back. Uh, so I couldn't tell. Is this integratable? Uh, like, does it need some sort of control over execution, or is it integratable? So, could you render um, in your Ember app just render a graffiti component oh, tag, I'm, and that I'm would work? I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess that I should have probably put a stupid <laughs> Ember demo. Uh, yes, the, yeah. the 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 entire point of this is that basically the consumer of your of your component does not need to give two cents two cents a crap about what how you implemented this, whether it's what it's using HTML bars, how, it's, how it does any of its stuff, that's all abstracted. They use it just like a normal HTML element. So that means that even your, if you have, uh, if you're on a big team, maybe you're not, but if you're like, like Netflix, you're on a big team and you've got just server, like guys who, are, who just do server side MVC with, with uh, you know, Grails or whatever have you, um, they can even use these components. You know, they just have to include the, your, your bundled JavaScript. Basically, it gets compiled down to a single JavaScript file you, you include, and it will automatically register it with the DOM. And they just have to use the element just like any other, any other element. Now, there's caveats to that in the sense of if you are trying to pass um, non-strings to a component, you can't, because of the whole attributes versus properties thing, um, you, if you're trying to pass like an array or an object, you do have to actually use the properties themselves to do that. Now, Ember is not, uh, integration with Ember is actually going to be perfectly fine because it has, um, I, I don't want to say props first, 
because we're probably changing. Uh, Mixonic and I have been talking about this a lot. But in the Ember ecosystem, it's going to just work out of the box. You're not. You're going to be able to pass arrays and and objects and whatever you want to these components, and it just works. It'll just work. You don't have to do anything. Um, it's just going to work. Um, React, uh, I had to lobby for some specific changes. And uh, thankfully, as of last week, I can say that the, the, the Canary branch does work with Glimmer. Uh, the main issue was custom attributes. They did not support custom attributes, which is <laughs> insane. But I, I know why, but it's insane. Um, but uh, So now it works in Canary, and they're, they're going to be cutting a release whenever they feel like it. Um, you guys don't care about that, though. <laughs> but. Uh, so yes, so um, you use it just like you'd use any other HTML element, um, except for those cases where you need to pass non-strings. You need to use the properties, not the, not set attribute. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. And by the way, I, as as if if interest does pick up on this, I and because I'm primarily an Ember person, like my day, I day to day, I do a lot of Ember. Um, I do plan on creating an add-on that will let you, you know, use an Ember CLI add-on that will let you put your graffiti components in with your Ember app, and it will transpile them with it, um, and let you know so that you can also, fingers crossed, without too much hackiness, uh, use routable components into a graffiti component. So the, theoretically, you could actually write your entire views in graffiti, um, and not even actually use an Ember view. But uh, there's caveats to that, and I can't promise the entire story, but def there definitely is going to be an add-on for it. Um, question? Hi, yeah, I have a question about the way the events work. So they bubble up like in the DOM, so if you have a, a parent and a child, the event will bubble up and you can just put a listener function in there. If you had sibling uh, components, is there a way to get them to talk to each other? Um, that, that is how you communicate. Just like you'd communicate with actions, um, it works the, the, the same way. You could, you could um, you, it, uh, I didn't show it in here, but, but very similar to actions, there's a way of currying um, uh, functions to a, an event. And you could basically um, you could tell a component, like a nested component, hey, trigger this event when I click you, or whatever, or, or when, when save, or whatever. And it will actually trigger that, that native event and bubble up, and then you can capture that uh, in your parent component. <laughs> So really, it, it, it's almost identical to, to how actions work, except for it's not an abstraction. And it's also doesn't throw, the, the major difference between an action and a event is that, uh, like a native DOM event, is a native DOM event can fire and forget. Like it, it can happen and there's no, re, like it cannot, no one could catch it and it's OK. Whereas an action, if no one catches it, if it's triggered and no one catches it, that's an error. You know, it's basically saying you have to take an action on this. Um, and why that's OK in Ember is because y if you write your components correctly, you're supposed to opt into them sending the action, not to have the action sent by default um, in most cases. But, uh, but other than that, it's going to work very much like Ember. OK, I think we'll cut the questions there on in the interest of time. Um, Jay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you all.